So I'd like to thank Jennifer and the team that invited me to this very exciting conference. Delighted to be here, uh, at least remotely, and share some of the things I've been thinking about and studying for a number of years now. So I'll share uh, my slides here and bring it up for you. Just take a second. What I'm going to talk about is extroverts, ambiverts, and introverts as leaders during the pandemic. So it's bringing my research. I'm doing a book for Stanford on extroverts, ambiverts, and introverts as leaders. So I've done about 350 interviews. Let me just show you some of the research I've done here getting ready for this. So I've done 350 interviews with what's called C-suite executives. These are men and women that have seen their titles, CEO, COO, CFO, and so on. So they're senior executives, typically of, of big companies. They, they've risen through the ranks as leaders over a number of years. And on the other side, I've interviewed about 30 CEOs since the shutdown in March. For my radio show, it's called The CEO Series. It's heard on CJD here in Montreal. Um, also for my Forbes blog, my, a weekly piece I do for Les Affaires in French. And for my CEO Insights class for the MBAs here at McGill. So I've interviewed, among others, the CEO of Aldo, a big retailer here in Canada that's gone into CCAA or bankruptcy protection a couple months ago. The CEO of Air France, Ben Smith, a Canadian, used to run Air Canada, now is running Air France KLM. Stephen Brofman, I work in the Brofman building, a very wealthy family that's been very generous to McGill and elsewhere. The president of Lawbaz, Sarah Davis, the chair of Canadian Tire, Maureen Sabia, the CEO of Canadian Tire, and so on. So what I've interviewed is many senior executives about how do you deal with the pandemic. And many talked about a war room, that they set up a war room in order to manage the pandemic crisis. So I want to talk a little bit about introverts, ambiverts, and extroverts, some of the key ideas around this, and invite you to think about which you are, and think a little bit about how you might manage yourself as an introvert, ambivert, or extrovert going forward in your leadership journey, then reflect on some of the key lessons coming from these senior leaders in Canada and elsewhere as CEOs or C-suite executives dealing with a crisis such as we're in now. And it's interesting, I commented a bit on the airline industry, and in the airline industry, this is the most extraordinary times we've ever seen. I commented a bit on the airline industry, and the airline industry, this is the most extraordinary times we've seen in aviation history. When you think about SARS or 9-11, nothing compares to this current crisis. Now in retailing, although it's gone into banks for protection, a number of Canadian retailers are, as they find out it's incredibly difficult, or restaurants. I had Antonio Park, a great restaurateur from Montreal, come to CU Insights class last week. 19 restaurants, 14 are shut down, five are essentially doing delivery to a very large degree. They're surviving, but it's tough times in a lot of industries. So when I think about it, it's a time that needs leadership, that needs to take us forward. I want to step back and think a little bit about what is this idea of introversion, ambiversion, and extroversion. So the central idea behind it, the central construct is that extroverts are more energized by stimulation. Introverts are tired by external stimulation. So extroverts like myself, we find reward in being stimulated. We find reward from being with strangers, being with people, it energizes us. Where introverts are great people, they're wonderful people, but they are driven down and they run out of energy by being with people. So they're great with people, but at a certain point they go enough of that and they have to take introvert breaks. So it's about how the dopamine systems in our brain receive reward. So mine is rewarded and I get dopamine hits by being with people, by being stimulated. Introverts, more the opposite. So that's one of the central constructs we think about when we think about introversion and extroversion. So it appears from research, they looked at four month old babies and then followed them for decades. So four month old babies don't talk. And it's something where they looked at the response to stimulation. So I'm a large noisy man. Uh, some of our alumni come on with their babies and their mom or dad holds them. So most babies will cling to their mom or dad's chest because I have a deep voice, I'm big and noisy. Where a few babies will turn around and look at me and be excited. And what that suggests is they're more apt to be extroverts later on in life. So they looked at four month old baby and the response to stimulation, and then looked at them, followed them for decades. So it's something where it appears to be 40, maybe 50% inherited. So it's part of the way we are, we're hardwired that way. So it's something where it's, it's that, and it's also cultural and so on, but a big part of it is inherited. And it affects how we work, play, love, and learn. Now it's a spectrum. So what we have is it's a bell curve, so some people like myself are extreme extroverts, some are more extreme introverts, but most people are a little bit extroverted, a little bit introverted. So it's something where uh, it is a bell curve and so it's not black or white. And indeed, when you think about human beings, human beings are very complex people. This is one way of looking at people. 
We also might think about gender, we might think about race, we might think about the functional area of the work. They've been an accountant for years, they've been in sales for years. Also, there's a cultural overlay. So I lived in the US for six years, five years in England, taught at Oxford, and then I was I lived most of my life here in Toronto or Montreal and Regina for a couple of years, where I adjust my personality. So when I go to England, I get a British accent, I'm quieter and act a bit more introverted. When I go down to the US, particularly the East Coast as opposed to the West Coast, I'm noisier and a bit more American in that sense. So there's a cultural overlay as well. So when I think about someone like Jennifer, if you asked her parents or friends, they'd say maybe she's an introvert, she's a woman, whatever they else may describe her, but they would agree that she's much more complex than those few descriptors. So there's a famous saying, if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. So if you were at my house today, you would look in the backyard here and you'd see a fence that I built a couple of years ago and simple wood fence. And I was putting in a screw with a hammer. And one of our elderly neighbors came by and said, Carl, that's wrong, almost morally wrong, because the screw is a better fastening device than a nail if you use a screwdriver. So the point he was making, you need the right tool. So when I think about human beings, this is one way of looking at people, but don't overdo it. Let me press forward. So two of the key dimensions from a leadership viewpoint, one here is on the left is simulation, excitement, and calm. So extroverts are rewarded by the dopamine system in their brain that they like excitement, where introverts prefer calm. So it's the amount of stimulation, like that's the central construct of introversion and uh, extroversion. The bottom is decision-making. Extroverts like action, introverts like deliberation, like to think things through. Introverts like to connect the dots and think things through before they come to a conclusion, where extroverts tend to jump to conclusions more rapidly. Both have strengths and some weaknesses. So the, the strength of an extrovert is quick to make decisions, quick to get to things, but sometimes it gets me in trouble because I don't think it through. I'm not giving it the thought that I should. So when I go to dinner with my wife and daughter and son who are introverts, I order very quickly. I just look at the menu, I'm ready to go, where my wife, son and daughter will discuss it with the server. Now, being in Montreal, they do it in French. So it, it seems to take a little bit longer in general, but they go on to discuss it. Or I just make quick decisions, but I may miss that exciting item on the menu that I've never had before. So that's the negative of the extrovert in decision-making and the bias to action. Now, introverts, it's the opposite problem is paralysis by analysis. So they overthink it. They're going to not make a decision and take too long to get somewhere. So that's the danger of the introvert. On the other hand, they have to make better decisions because they're thinking it through. So if I, when I have introverts work for me in meetings, at a certain point, I'll look at them and just look at them and saying, are you ready to speak? And if they go, no, I won't call them. But if they go, yes, I'll call them and say, Jennifer, what do you think? Because I know she will have thought it through and she doesn't say dumb things. She may wait too long sometimes, but she's going to jump into action and get there. So I gave a talk at the Harvard Business School uh, last year and a couple hundred, 200 of the Harvard MBAs. I was delighted for the BCOMs I taught at McGill were doing their Harvard MBAs, very proud of them. And it was about being an introvert and how do you deal with the case method where it's all cases, 800 over two years. And it's more of a challenge for an introvert. So they need to learn to be a bit flexible, okay? So now we have this new term, I don't know if you've heard about it, called ambiverts. It was actually invented in Toronto. So as a Canadian, I'm very proud of that, in the 1920s. So a researcher came up with the term ambivert as someone between the extroverts and the introverts up here at the top that can act like an introvert at times and an extrovert at other times. So this is an important term for us to understand. So the title of my book for Stanford is We're All Ambiverts Now. Now I'm looking at a senior leader, 350 C-suite executives. So they're senior people who've made it up through the ladder typically in their 40s and 50s. So more the age of your parents as opposed to your age as undergraduates or you know, new graduates. So when you look at it, what we wanna do is understand that ambiverts bring real strengths to the party. And why I'm asking that we all have to act like ambiverts as a leader, at times I have to act like an introvert to be effective, other times like an expert. So for example, an introvert is more apt to listen and think things through. And that can be a very useful skill. We'll get into dealing with the pandemic, why that is so valuable during the pandemic and during crises in general. We'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Now, the extrovert brings excitement and energy. If someone's feeling kind of you know, tired at work, you say, go have a coffee with the extrovert. They'll pump you up. So there's a time an executive's got to kind of pump up the energy, get people going. So I'm arguing that senior people have got to learn to be ambiverts in their behavior. You've got to act like an introvert at times or an extrovert at other times. I think it's true of younger leaders like yourselves as well. 
but it is exhausting. And after you act like the other, so as an extrovert, I can act like an introvert. And in fact, as you get older and you have kids, for example, you might find that around grade four, you lose your name, you're Eric's father. In that context, he's more important, so you accept that as an adult. So something where I've got to act like an introvert at times and listen more, but it's tiring, so I take extrovert breaks. So an extrovert break is one, so I read a lot about introvert breaks. So introverts get breaks where they go for a walk, they listen to music, they read a book where they reduce the stimulation so they can recharge their batteries. And when I read about introverts, I said, well, how come I don't get breaks as an extrovert? And there was nothing in the literature, and I wrote some articles, one for Warden Leader Di Leadership Digest. There's some things at the back at the end of this presentations, if you want to do some more reading about some of the stuff I've written about. And I realized that after sitting and writing a book for a couple hours in my office by myself, ironically about introverts, I can't take it anymore. So I head down to the second floor where there's an endless supply of undergrads I'm teaching, giving grades to admittedly, that I can recharge my batteries by being with and be ready to get back and writing again. Or if I go to a restaurant without my wife and kids, I'll eat at the bar, talk to total strangers, because I get energy from it. Where introverts would have to sit at a table and read a good book. And I take a good book or my iPad these days so I can read if, you know, if no one wants to talk, but generally people are willing to talk, discuss things. So when we look at it, we have this idea. Now, when I heard about ambiverts, I go, I'm jealous. They just seem like better people. But after interviewing a bunch of ambiverts, I realized that two things. One is that it's not one third, one third, one third across the bell curve. It's about 40% of people are introverts, 40% are extroverts, about 20% are genuine ambiverts. The other thing is I realized that they don't have the strengths to the same degree as introverts or extroverts. They have them, but not to the same degree. And finally, they're confusing to people. Sometimes you're like this, sometimes you're like this. I don't understand you. It's kind of the reaction people have. And so it's helpful for ambiverts to explain who they are and what they are. Now, let me get back to my slides for a minute here, and I'll just share a little bit more. So we've talked about some of these things and some of the characteristics of the, of the two. I wanna move on and look at the lockdown. So I wrote an article with one of my former students who works at BCG now in New York City, Kat Garcia, about how tough it is during the lockdown for an extrovert. And I wrote an article for Forbes, my Forbes blog with Henry Mintzberg's daughter, one of her most famous professors. Uh, she lives over in England. She's an introvert. So we talked about it was challenging on both sides, but probably harder for an extrovert. But it's interesting because what I did was look at, so we understand introverts, ambiverts, and extroverts. Now let's look at the crisis. So I interviewed 30 plus CEOs since the crisis started. So one of the things I would talk to them about is, did you have a war room? How did you handle the pandemic? Talk about how did you do strategy during the pandemic? What are you thinking about coming out of the pandemic and also their leadership style? One of the big lessons that came to me is that during this kind of pandemic, probably the dominant style that was the most useful was the more introverted because we don't know what to do. No one's seen times like this unless you're in World War II, maybe. And the Queen of England, 90 something, as a young woman, was an ambulance driver during World War II. But again, those people are, if they're around at all, are getting on and are not involved in the day to day world. So none of us had things that we could draw analogies to. The airline industry had never seen anything like this. So what we have here is this idea that Mintzberg talks about of emergent strategy. We have Michael Porter at Harvard who talks about deliberate strategy. And so the emergent strategy approach is one which seems to be most germane, most relevant during these times, because we don't know. There is no formula. So part of what you have to do during emergent strategy is that strategy tend to bubble up from the frontline troops, what we call boundary spanners. People have one foot in the turbulent world and one foot in the organization. So the theory is you have an organization and if you have a lot of turbulence outside, you've got to change inside more rapidly. So where those strategies come from is listening to frontline troops who are actually part of that turbulent environment. And you look at how they create solutions for customers, for suppliers. So ideas are bubbling up. So deliberate kind of comes from the CEO. They sit down with McKinsey, Bain, BCG, and come up with great strategies that are simply delivered to the rest of us, and the rest of us kind of salute and deliver and go out there and execute. And if it doesn't go well, they blame us for not executing as opposed to their ideas. Sometimes that works. You think of the five forces that Michael Porter talks about, and I still teach that, or the three generic strategies, still teach that, did that this week. And we like Michael, and McGill gave him an honorary doctorate. So, but what we're arguing is his ideas are not as relevant during times of crisis where we want ideas to bubble up throughout the organization, not just from the very top, because the top people are only one or two people. They don't have the ideas because 
no one does. But if we listen to lots of people throughout the organization, ideas bubble up. Now the job of the senior people is to say, those are great ideas. We'll resource them and we'll spread them and new strategies will emerge. So during times of the pandemic and crises like this, though this is fairly unique, the ability to listen, the ability to think things through, like the introvert's good at, is what's called for, rather than jumping to conclusions, rather than jumping to solutions, because we don't know what we're jumping to. We've got to learn, and we've got to really listen to Generation Zs and Millennials particularly. Because we may ignore them in the normal world, but today they have more of the keys to the success of the future of our organization. So when I talk to people like uh, David Benson, who runs Aldo, Stephen Brockman, who had a Claridge, uh, Sarah Davis from Loblaws, uh, Alan McDonald, who was CCO, COO rather, of Canadian Tire Toll recently and is the, becoming a CEO of a big company in the Maritimes, uh, I think next week or so. Talking to these senior leaders and about over 30 of them, what the skills were called for were the more introverted skills of listening, of paying attention, of stepping back and thinking rather than jumping to action. Now, at a certain point, the extroverts jumping to action, the extroverts ability to inspire was required to some degree. But really during these times, it's more the introverted style. Now, when I say we're all introverts now, what that saying is that I'm an extrovert and that's fine. But what I want to do is learn to control myself, learn to listen more, be like the introvert. And that's what's required, the leadership style during these tough times. So it's something where what we see is an evolution of what's required. Let me just share my screen again here. So I want to step back before I give you three key takeaways from what we've talked about this morning. First is that we have a couple of leaders we want to talk about who are introverts, but can act like an expert is required. So Justin Trudeau, I knew him from his McGill days. He appears to be the world's biggest extrovert. But when I sat down with him, I interviewed him from a radio show. He said, I think I'm an introvert who's learned to be an expert. I am so perfectly happy to sit in the corner and read a good book and be on my own, go for a walk in the woods or a long hike. It really deeply satisfies me. These are very much traditional introvert breaks versus the fact my job is very much being a people person. And I like people. I like exchanging. But that's when I am on. I'm doing the work that I need to do. If given the choice, I like a small group of friends to kick back and relax with. So what Mr. Uh, Trudeau is saying, our prime minister, is that he's an introvert, but he needs to act like an expert on occasion. Actually, fairly often as prime minister, it's the nature of the job. I also interviewed a guy named Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel Peace Prize. So I went over to Safito Hotel after he gave a speech at McGill, and I went to interview him. And I said, Mohammed, are you an introvert or extrovert? And the four people with him laughed at the foolishness of the question. He's a huge introvert, and they all knew that. But what he said was, I'm an introvert, but I'm helping millions of the poorest women and children on earth. How can I not like an act like an, act like an extrovert? So these are two very well-known leaders that are very much introverts, but have learned to act like an extrovert. So what I'm saying is that certain times, the expert needs to step back and act like an introvert, like these men do, in order to be effective leaders out there in today's world of the pandemic. So my three key takeaways, introverts love you. So something traditionally we've looked at leaders as being really extroverts. That's what the literature said. I wrote a, I read a book rather by Susan Cain called Quiet about six, seven years ago, wrote a Forbes blog about it, got 60,000 views, 10 times normal. It really resonated with people. So I interviewed a guy named Claude Mangeau, who was the C, CEO of CN, 24,000 people, big uh, train company headquartered in Montreal. And I never asked anyone before, but I asked him and he said, I'm an introvert and went on for 10 minutes in a quiet way about being an introvert. In fact, they trained him to be uh, more extroverted because he's going to be CEO. So a coach gave him a clicker, like someone has, you know, letting people into a bar and had to click it five times a day. For example, he'd get in the elevator in the morning, go up six floors at the headquarters of uh, CN on the Le Gauchetier in Montreal, and normally look at his feet and just save CN money. But they said, no, if you get in the elevator, you say things like, oh, good morning, Jennifer. So you acknowledge her and then you say, Jennifer, say something like it's a, it's a nice day out there. It's something she's not gonna argue with and say, Jen, really appreciated your presentation last week. You killed it. Then get off the elevator because that's what a CEO does. And if a CEO or a senior leader, the president of McGill gets in the elevator, ignores people, we go, we're in trouble. I'm gonna send my resume to Concordia. So it's an overreaction, but that's part of the role of a senior leader is to be like that extrovert, which Claude had learned to do. But what I came to realize through many, many interviews that many of our senior leaders, CEOs, 
prime ministers, presidents are in fact introverts and they're extraordinarily valuable what they bring to the table. So we're rethinking the value. We used to focus too much on experts. Today we go, introverts absolutely love you. Second point is we're born that way. So relax. God made you that way. It's all right. So introverts, if you're introvert, that's the way you were hardwired to a large degree. You need to grow and, and be a bit different. Extroverts, that's the way you were made. So relax and enjoy that fact. That's the reality of who you are and lean into it. But the third point is, but the third point is, in a pandemic, introverts are particularly useful as leaders because of what's required of leadership during a pandemic and stepping back in times of trouble. So if you want to read a bit more about what I've written, here's some articles from The Economist, The Globe Mail, uh, Warden Leadership Digest, EFT, and so on. Uh, I've written quite a bit about it. Um, the book will be out uh, next year, hopefully. So thanks for the wonderful invitation, Jennifer and crew, to speak to Excite. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. Give me an email if you have any questions.